Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Virtual Digital Humanities Center. Uh, welcome back if you're returning, and uh, welcome if this is your first time virtually visiting with us. Uh, I'm Pam Lack, my pronouns are she, her, uh, and I'm the Digital Humanities Librarian and Director of the DH Center here at San Diego State. I'm also the co-director of our campus-wide DH initiative. Uh, before I introduce our workshop instructor for the day, I'll start with our uh, campus land acknowledgement. For millennia, the Kumeyaay people have been a part of this land. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the San Diego State community, we acknowledge this legacy. We promote this balance and harmony. We find inspiration from this land, the land of the Kumeyaay. And I've put into chat more info about our land acknowledgement. Um, and if you are joining us from a place outside of San Diego, feel free to let us know whose land you are uh, joining us from. And um, I will in a moment also paste several links into chat about the DH initiative, the DH center, and the um, links to more of our virtual programming. We've got uh, another workshop series scheduled for April that I'll be leading on digital pedagogy and lots of virtual book talks, including one this coming Monday called How Pac-Man Eats, which looks to be a really amazing uh, book talk. Um, if you've missed any of um, our previous events or if you can't make some of our events, um, just about everything's been recorded and you can find links to it um, in the link I'm about to paste into chat in just a moment. But with that, it's my uh, delight and pleasure to introduce our instructor for this week, um, who also was our instructor last week for our Ethical uh, Data uh, Science Workshop Series. Uh, Brienne Hayes holds a BS in Applied Mathematics from San Diego State University and will be beginning their PhD in English in the fall. Um, we are just waiting to hear which institution they choose. They have worked as a data scientist for organizations, including the Port of San Diego and the Information Sciences Institute at USC. Their research focuses on the intersection of the digital with issues of gender and sexuality. So please join me in uh, welcoming Brianne back to this workshop. Um, and I'll also post in chat link to last week's um, workshop in case you missed it. But thank you so much and take it away, Brie. Thank you so much, Pam. Hello, everyone. So yeah, my name is Brienne. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm very excited to be here today. Let me go ahead and just give me a moment to uh, share my presentation with you all, and we'll get started. Um, so yes, this is part two of ethical data science. Today, we're going to be talking about using data. Last week, we talked about different ways to get data, and we talked a lot about uh, critiquing and thinking critically and ethically about issues of data. Um, if you didn't see last week's uh, uh, session, like Pam said, it was recorded, so you can check out that recording. Uh, but we'll also be doing a little bit of review about some of the key concepts at the beginning here. So uh, you don't you the, the sessions were meant to be more or less independent. So don't worry if you uh, if this is your first time joining us. So, uh, Pam has probably posted this in the chat already, but slides are available at this link. Uh, definitely recommend uh, keeping this link handy somewhere because uh, there are tons of links apart from this one, uh, in these slides to all sorts of resources, um, especially at the end, I have a long list of resources around uh, data science uh, that um, uh, is worth looking into. Uh, so definitely uh, keep, this, uh, keep this link handy for future reference. So quick overview of what we're gonna be talking about today. So first I'm gonna be kind of reviewing some of the key conceptual topics from the first session, thinking about data and getting data. Um, then we're going to be, our two main topics today are uh, two primary uses of data, which are machine learning, more or less make it, using data to make more data, and data visualization. Uh, how, how are we arguing with data? How are we displaying our data? In both cases, we're going to talk about uh, some, we're going to talk about uh, conceptual and critical issues in both these areas. And then I'm going to walk you through some tools that lets you, will, will let you work with data yourself. At the end, like I said, at the end, I have a long list of resources that you can check out. So this is the second part of two-part workshop. Like I already said, there's a recording there. Now let's move on to the review. Uh, so just a couple of key concepts uh, that I think are really important to thinking about doing data science. The most important one I would, I would say is the idea of data as CAPTA. Uh, this is an idea that uh, I got from uh, Joanna Drucker. Um, 
And the idea is that uh, when we think of data, we think about information as being given to us in a more or less complete objective form um, and sort of an independent form. Uh, when we think of data, when we can reconceptualize data as CAPTA, we instead switch it and think about information as received as something that we have taken. Um, and so CAPTA emphasizes the subjectivity of all data. It emphasizes our bias as observers and it emphasizes the in, in essential incompleteness of data. And this is a really important concept so we don't get, we don't get stuck in the trap of thinking that data is an always uh, perfectly uh, objective description of reality. A couple other key ideas, abstraction. Uh, we have to remember that data does not stand in for the subject, that whenever we, got, we collect data about a subject, you're necessarily abstracting away from them. And that abstraction might have detrimental effects to their representation. Categories, uh, we, the, the kind of categories that we have to think about when we're collecting data or when we're using data uh, are not fixed things, they're not static things. Um, these can be anything as wide as, especially we're talking about humans, so issues of obviously race and gender, as well as things that we might think as a little more static, like, like geography and time. These categories are actually much more fluid than we tend to think of them. And when we kind of fix them in a, in a data set, we're treating, we're, we're removing a level of, of uh, the complexity of reality that, that um, is important for describing what's going on. So we have to be very careful when picking our categories. Uh, we have to always keep in mind that the categories we do, pick, we do decide to focus on when doing data science are themselves an interpretation of reality. And reductionism, uh, as in how much context has to be lost to use data and is the trade-off worthwhile, as similar to abstraction. Uh, anytime we are gathering data about a subject, we are abstracting from the subject, similarly reducing the subject to a set of data points. People are not data points, people are much more complex than that. No matter what organizations like uh, Google and Amazon uh, might want to be the case, uh, we can't reduce all people's behaviors and feelings down to a set of uh, machine readable information. And so we have to always keep in mind that there is this trade off uh, of, uh, of reducing people down when we're using data. And we always have to keep in mind is this a trade off that we want to make? And the biggest reminder I have for you is when, you, when using data science is consider the why before the how. As in, if you're using data, if you decide you want to use data science on a project, think about why you think that a data-based approach is right for this project before you think about how to implement that. Data science is a powerful tool, but it's not the only tool available. And because it's kind of a, a hot topic nowadays um, because of its economic relevance, and because of the advances in the technology, uh, we, we might want to jump to using data just because it's there. We always have to we always have to critically examine our motivations before we do so. And a couple of big framing questions: uh, Why do I like I said? Why do I want to use data science? What benefits and complications of data science add to my project? Is the significance of my data commensurate to my confidence? I'll use the data well, as in. To the, the, as in what is the role that this data has in the project and is my own abilities as a data science scientist up to performing that role well? What opportunities might be I be opening or closing for others with this project? And of course, does my data fairly reflect, fairly re reflect reality or my own version of reality? And, am I, and, if it's, and of course, because all data is inherently subjective, am I making that subjectivity clear? Um, a couple quick review points about uh, retrieving about retrieving data. We're not going to go through the technical stuff, but just some things to keep in mind uh, when you're working with data sets. If you're using a data set someone else has built, you make sure you want to verify the origin of the data if you can. Think about who's providing the data and why. Think about how the data is structured and presented and what that data might be leaving out. We always want to be critical of the data we use, especially if it's data that we didn't gather ourselves. And then if you build your own data set, Always remember, only take as much as you need and no more. Interrogate your categories before you gather the data. Think about how the originators of the data, as in if you're not actually going and taking the measurements yourself, but collecting data from other sources, might react to your use of it. If you're taking tweets off of Twitter, for example, um, you might we have to keep in mind that people who are point of putting out their honest opinions and feelings uh, into the open may not want, may not be the happiest to um, find out that their words have been collected in some in some scientific data set somewhere. Uh, of course, that's something that they've enabled you to do by putting it on in, into the public in the first place, but it's something that, that you need to think about. Um, and finally, always ask, does this data set need to exist? We don't need to live in a world where literally everything about human life is quantified in a data set. Uh, and sometimes data sets can do more harm than they can do good. So before you gather your data sets, think about what that need actually is. 
So some assumptions going forward for the next two parts, uh, since we're kind of since last session was about gathering data, um, we're going to assume that you have data um, that you want to work with, uh, that you've critically investigated the data and its origins. This is a big assumption because you need to actually do this. You can't just assume we can't we can't always assume that you've done this or someone has done this. But for the case of actually using data, we're going to assume that you've done this for this step. And then uh, you have a purpose for that data. Again, don't just do unless you're just doing it to teach yourself uh, the mechanics of data science. Don't just do data science because it's cool. You you need to have a reason. You need to you know you you need to have some purpose behind your use of these tools. All right. So we're first we're going to talk about machine learning using data to make data. Um, so there are, AI is uh, it's a big thing. You it's it's in a lot of ways. AI has been big in the sort of the public imagination for a while. And it's been even bigger recently, especially with um, kind of the importance of that, uh, the importance of data science in the business and technology sphere. Uh, there are lots of different terms you may have heard uh, around AI um, that have similar that might are sometimes used interchangeably, and a lot of them have similar but distinct meanings. There's machine learning, deep learning, neural networks, mathematical modeling, statistical modeling, and all the. I don't have. I don't want to get into what all these things are because that would take a while, and it's not really pertinent to this conversation. But anyway, my point is, there's a lot of buzzwords. There's a lot of terms, um, and uh, there's a lot of neb and and ideas in that AI are, AI are still pretty nebulous in the public eye. Uh, the thing we need to know is that the common factor is pattern recognition. Uh, you need you're taking data, you're recognizing patterns within the data using a variety of approaches, and then you're making you're making predictions about other data using uh, that using those patterns. Um, so I'm going to go through a brief explanation of what machine learning uh, actually is. Um, it's it's uh, without trying not to get too technical, but trying to walk through sort of what the processes that are going on actually are, because I believe very strongly that you should at least know how your machine learning algorithms work before you use them. Um, we'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, but machine learning kind of boils down to computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience. Um, right there, there's a few kind of weird uh, phrases like what does automatically mean and what does experience mean? Uh, well, to an algorithm, experience means data. Uh, generally speaking, larger data sets produce more accurate machine learning models. Of course, there's more than one definition of accuracy. But generally speaking, if you have some sort of performance metric by which you're measuring uh, how well your, your machine learning model is doing, if you have more data to train that, that model on, uh, it's going to be more, it's going to, it's going to do better on that performance metric. So here's my, 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 my best shot at a brief walkthrough of, of how machine learning works. Machine learning algorithm uses training data to generate a model that produces an output based on a decision function. These outputs are then checked against testing data. So training and testing data, the idea is you have a data set, you split it up uh, into two parts, training and testing. Uh, the, rel the relative proportions of both parts are is a big subject in uh, uh, that is talked about by machine learning practitioners. There's a couple of different ways you can go about it. Uh, I've seen people, a lot of the times, 90% of your data for training and 10% for testing is adequate. Some people prefer 80% for training, 20% for testing. We're not going to get into that level of detail here, but just the idea is that most of your data you're going to use to train your model, and the rest of it you're going to use to, ver to, to verify the performance of that model. The model itself is just a mathematical equation. Uh, there's a lot of different mathematical equations at play. There are lots of different kinds of models in machine learning. Um, you hear lots of things about... Um, Linear regression, for example, uh, about logistic regression. These are just different different types of mathematical equations. And what they do is that they have a certain number of variables, and that's your data. Uh, you plug the variables into the equation, you compute a result, and your result is some number. Uh, that number is then fed into a decision function, uh, which is basically maps that uh, that number onto a category. That can be as simple as a true or false. So you have a machine learning algorithm that's trying to take instead of data points and make a binary judgment about it, or it could be mapping it onto one of a number of categories of, of different discrete categories. Um, and so, um, yeah, that is that is the basic uh, basics of how a machine learning algorithm works. Um, this is a, a I think a pretty decent visual summary. Um, again, training data goes in, trains the model, uh, then the model is tested against some testing data. Um, and then you can, and then you can go back and tweak the model. Uh, this loop of um, kind of taking your results and going back to to uh, retrain the algorithm is something that is 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 a little bit concerning. Uh, I didn't talk about it too much in this presentation, uh, but the reason that we want to separate our our training and testing data 
is because basically you don't want your machine learning model to to have seen the result that's going to be tested on because then it just it just memorizes basically just you're giving it the answer key and it memorizes the answers and that that kind of ruins its ability to be generalized to uh, to external data. Um, so that's an ethical that's that's another ethical concern that I just realized I haven't even I didn't even include in this presentation. Uh, so, but that's kind of something. If if you if you move on to practicing machine learning, that's something you'll definitely hear more about. So something I want to hammer in is that, like I said earlier, machine learning uh, is just a it's a set of it's a set of mathematical tools. It does not equal AI. I thought it was really funny when I was putting this presentation together, looking for some images, just looking up machine learning and seeing all of these. This is what popped up immediately on Google Images. All these images of of robots deep in thought, with lots of very smart looking data flying around, and I thought this was just kind of hilarious because it's a very like, it just strikes me as a very twenty first century thing, where where it's these like very high end sort of technological looking graphics that communicate absolutely no information whatsoever, um, and um, and I do think and it's it's obviously most people aren't concerned about the actual inner workings of machine learning, um, but as I mentioned previously. Um, AI is not AI is not machine learning. Machine learning is not AI, and this this idea of a robot thinking critically about some data in front of it is 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 kind of it's both an, it's both a, a a myth and it's kind of a harmful myth um, because the thing is is that machine learning is like I, said, I keep saying it's just a mathematical process. Um, where computers come in is just to make it possible to do it at large scales. You can do these ML algorithms by hand. I've done it for exams before. It's not fun. Um, ML models are deterministic and predictable. They don't think um, uh, they're different from deep learning, which is, I'm not going to talk about deep learning at all in this presentation because it's that I could go, because I think I would need at least three hours to go through deep learning, both in how it works and all the problems I have with it. Uh, so we're not going to go there. But basically, that's the important thing to keep in mind is that um, when you're doing machine learning, you're basically just using data to create a deterministic equation that makes judgments. Um, there's levels, there's room for error on every, on every single one of those levels. There's room for subjectivity in every single one of those levels. And you are not making a thinking machine. Uh, that is the most important thing to keep in mind. So if you did watch, happen to see the last, uh, my last, my previous presentation, you know, I talked a lot about these Venn diagrams of, uh, of data science. And I want to real quick revisit this one that I think is interesting. This is the original uh, sort of description of data science as the intersection of hacking skills, substantive expertise, and math and stats knowledge that was put out by Drew Conway in 2013. Uh, and a lot of people called attention to that danger zone I have circled there. Um, what Conway was trying to highlight is that uh, there's, you don't want, is that if you have, if you're trying to do data science, but you don't actually know how to do, don't understand at least fundamentally the math and statistics that are going into your process, it's dangerous because then it becomes really easy to manipulate data and really easy to misrepresent information. So that is something that I do want to highlight that that I do think if you're going to practice machine learning, you should have some level of understanding of the uh, the statistical processes that are going in behind it. I don't think you, that you need to um, know everything and be able to do it by hand per se, but I do think that knowledge is important. Additionally, other thing, what this danger zone also leaves out a lot of things. What about ethics? What about cult critical analysis? What about the cultural context? There's actually a lot more danger zones in this graphic. Uh, than it would imply. So these are all things we have to keep in mind as we move forward practicing machine learning. So a big question that comes up a lot about uh, in machine learning is, do you need to know how to program to do it? The answer is no. Uh, should you know how to program? You probably should, and I'll explain why in a little bit. Um, so there are, there are definitely no code machine learning tools. There are definitely ways that you can do machine learning without having to write a single line of code. Um, unfortunately, when you can't, when you can't code yourself, you're basically relying on other people to implement your machine learning algorithms for you. Um, and those pre-existing processes can sometimes be expensive. They can readily be not designed for your use case. You're going to have to finagle them to get them to do what you wanted to do. And they might be concealing critical steps. As I highlighted on a couple slides ago, if you don't understand the sort of the back end of your, your machine learning process, you are leaving room for uh, not only for error, uh, but for concealments, but for uh, kind of a lack of transparency, that's important to doing data science ethically. And if you're not designing the process, if you're not using a system that you designed yourself, or at least have access to on the back end yourself, it's really easy that you don't even know what's going on here. 
But even still, I do want to go through a couple of the tools that are available. Uh, so probably if you are completely brand new to machine learning, the best place to start is Teachable Machine, which is a, which is a Google product. It's free. Um, it's extremely user friendly. It's probably the, the simplest machine learning um, user interface that I have yet encountered. Uh, it is intended for students um, and the options are very, very limited for what you can model. This really is a teaching tool and not much more. It's not really meant for doing high level analysis. It's not customizable. There's only a small handful of things that you can do with it right now. Like it doesn't handle text at all. It just has a couple of image processing things. Um, so uh, I would definitely recommend taking a look at it if you don't, if you don't have no experience with machine learning and you want to kind of see how the process looks, but it's not really useful for your projects. Um, Create ML is a much larger machine learning platform uh, made through Apple. Uh, it's intended for, there's, it's got all the important models and it. it handles all kinds of data. Um, it is intended for mobile developers. So it's not, so this is when it says, when it says no code, it means people who don't know um, sort of the high level programming languages uh, that are often done in implementing these data science, in these, these machine learning algorithms. But there is still a level of technological expertise that is assumed. Uh, the other problems, of course, are that it's only available on Apple devices and it's pretty expensive. Um, and then Google Cloud Auto, Auto, Auto ML um, is very similar. Um, there's a lot of options. Um, it's very technically involved. So again, there's a level of technical expertise that is assumed. It's entirely cloud-based, which is a good and a bad thing. Um, we'll talk about which I'll explain why in a couple of slides. And again, it's expensive. Um, so the looking when I was researching for this presentation, all the no-code uh, machine learning products that are out there, it became pretty evident that the one that they're largely intended for larger organizations that have experienced tech people. Uh, this is basically for uh, tech companies or companies that are already invested in data in some degree that want to do data science, but don't want to pay up, hire a data scientist. Um, so they aren't, for most of, for our purposes, for doing, uh, if you're, whether you're doing, unless, basically if you're doing machine learning outside of a uh, business context, they really aren't the ideal solution. Um, and if you really want to do machine learning on your own, you need to learn some code. And I know that the idea of learning how to code for a lot of people is absolutely terrifying. Uh, because of a lot of reasons, a lot of which are cultural, having to do with um, telling certain people that that code, that programming is a thing that belongs to a very specific category of people and that no one else is smart enough to handle, or I don't, or fears about to. And there's, there's, this is a topic again I could talk about for a long time. But if you are concerned about learning how to code, don't be. You don't need to learn that much to do machine learning. It isn't that hard. There's lots of weight ways to learn. Um, you can implement algorithms that already exist while only changing a few lines. You can see how they work. Uh, you can do it for free in 99% of cases, and you can understand the uh, understand all the processes you're using. Um, you just have to copy and paste stuff. So um, the main two programming languages that are that are frequently brought up in discussion. Sorry, my dog is scratching at my door there, and hopefully you can't. It's not too distracting. Um, the main two programming languages that are often used in uh, machine learning are Python and R. Uh, they're both fantastic uh, for their own uh, reasons. Most people start with Python. Um, I am highly biased towards R, but uh, either is a good way to go. Uh, here are some resources for learning, uh, some really great books. Uh, Data Science from Scratch and Introduction to Machine Learning with Python are both in Python. Um, Data Science from Scratch is great because it also teaches you the mathematics and the statistics behind uh, the uh, data science, it not just uh, how to code, how to program. Um, and Introduction to Machine Learning with Python is a great reference text that has lots and lots of information about how, how to implement different machine learning algorithms. R for Data Science is actually the book that I use to teach myself how to program. It's completely free online. Um, it is fantastic. It's one of my favorite books ever. I highly recommend it. Um, and it's just a lot of fun. Um, and then for doing machine learning, in after, uh, once you have some programming fundamentals, you can do machine learning in these, in these platforms. I recommend using the scikit-learn package in Python and the caret package in R. Um, both of these, uh, both of the, if you follow the links there, uh, that'll take you to the documentation for both of these packages and that have lots and lots of information on how to implement uh, key machine learning algorithms with relatively little uh, original programming on your end. So in summary, um, how are we doing on time here? Okay, I'm right on time. I'm right on, I'm right on, on a schedule. Um, cool. Um, so in summary, uh, machine learning, it's a mathematical system for pattern recognition, useful for predicting data based on other data. Um, it's not intelligence, it's deterministic. 
um, using machine learning without understanding of the statistics and algorithms underlying it can be risky because you're ignorant to some of the processes that are going on. And sometimes the algorithm might be making decisions that you might not be able to explain. And while no code platforms for machine learning exist, learning some code, it really is the way to go to doing your own ML. Uh, it's not, it, it's, you can do it. Trust me, um, it's, it's, and it'll open up a lot of avenues for you in terms of doing research or just doing personal projects um, because a little bit of coding goes a long way. One last thing, um, I'm not gonna pretend to have scratched the surface of uh, ethical problems inherent in the AI, machine learning, deep learning, and so on space. Uh, one thing, like here's an, just an example, um, that's something that doesn't, um, that we might not think about unless you think about uh, AI a lot is that deep learning, which is kind of the big way to do AI in a lot of larger organizations right now, uh, has become a very substantial con contributor to carbon emissions due to the sheer amount of, elect of electricity it takes to train and run these, these algorithms. Um, there's too much to cover in a single hour, so I'm going to move on. Uh, but just that's something I do want to, uh, talking about showing your own subjectivities, I am not going to pretend to have covered every ethical issue in AI in this 30 minute segment. Uh, so if you're interested in doing more AI, I would highly recommend uh, there's, a, there's some references at the end I recommend checking out. Moving on to data visualization. So this is really the idea behind visualization is you're arguing with data. You now have some data, maybe you've done some analysis on the data, and now you want to show this data to other people. But in doing so, you're going to be making an argument with it. Uh, something um, I want to include this little message here uh, um, that I heard at a talk that was given by the, um, the media psychologist, uh, Charisse Lepree, at a, at a talk. Uh, that I attended yesterday. Um, she mentioned just kind of offhand that it's alarming how little we question our media. And I thought this was really interesting because, well, yes, it's true. And also I was thinking about, while I was finishing this, this presentation up, I was thinking about, you know, data visualizations are media, they're a form of media, uh, but we don't think of them so much. The re there's, this, there's this sort of phenomenon where data visualizations present an assumption of factuality and authority. You look at a graph and you see points and you're like, ah, that is reality right there because this was measured and someone just took those measurements and put them into a graph. We don't think about how actually presenting this information uh, in this visual format, there are so many assumptions and, and sort, of, sort of little nuances that go into it that, that do abstract it further away from reality. And we can't look at a graph and assume, uh, and I'm not just talking about people who are faking data, I'm talking about people who are using completely legitimate data, but presenting it either in ways that are misleading or in ways that lack, or, or in, or in ways, that, ways that lack context. And we'll have lots of case studies in a little bit. But I think this is a really important way to kind of frame data visualization is once again from Joanna Drucker um, in uh, her essay, Humanities Approaches to Graphical Display. I highly, highly recommend reading that, uh, that paper is available for free online. It, it kind of, it kind of uh, informs a lot of my thinking um, that I've presented in this presentation. But kind of sum it up in her words, the rendering of statistical information into graphical form gives it a simplicity and legibility that hides every aspect of the original interpretive framework on which the statistical data were constructed. The main problem with data visualizations is that they do present that era of factuality and authority, and they don't present all the things, all the ways of thinking and assumptions that went into creating those visualizations. Visualization is an argument. Anytime you're seeing a data visualization, you are receiving an argument and you need to critique that argument. So this is a uh, this is not real data, but this is a hypothetical uh, this is a hypothetical um, uh, uh, data visualization that Drucker presented in her paper. Uh, the idea is that this is the number of men and women in seven different nations, A through F. Um, what is the argument of this visualization? Uh, pretty much, this is pretty stripped down, but you could basically the argument is that that the uh, pro, the population proportions, male to female, in these seven nations are as presented here. Um, what assumptions are implicit in this visualization? This might seem like a pretty straightforward thing, like, oh, it's the number of people, that's a, that's a countable variable, uh, it's nations, those are discrete things. But really, if you, think, if you start thinking about it, nearly everything in here is, is, has some level of subjectivity. Uh, what, is, what is to define man and woman? Uh, what is to define nations? Do the people who, are, who live in these nations think of themselves as being in dis discreetly marked nations, A through F, um, in the same way that people collecting the data do? Are the people only ever in, in these nations? Like, do they stay in place or do they move around? Uh, there's all sorts of stuff going on here and that is, that is hidden by the visualization. Um, so Drucker, it then includes that this really fascinating alternate um, visualization that sort of complicates the original. We can see a couple of, you can sort of, you can see a couple of um, 
kind of interesting modifications uh, in the visual display. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, Nation D, you see that the um, you see that the sort of the sort of the genders are mixed. Uh, that that there's not that there's a that there's a com there's a combination of male and female because you know maybe people in Nation D have a different gender system. Uh, notice how dots are moving back and forth between B and C. That represents the the, the flow of men of of men workers across the borders of nations B and C. Um, notice how uh, on an A uh, the sort of um, the 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 male uh, bar sort of comes into existence as as it goes along. That represents sort of changing conceptions of gender as people in this nation age. So there's lots of so. Uh, this is obviously just a hypothetical example, but I think this is really important to thinking about ways that we can do visualization better. Um, you know, think, not just not just presenting information in a straightforward way that hides categories, but doing so in a creative way that reveals uh, the complications in the categories that we picked. Um, and so now I want to move on to a couple of case studies. So first, we're going to talk about some re some really bad visualizations. Then we're going to talk about some really good visualizations. And the key takeaways we can get from these. So I don't know if anyone in this, if anyone here is familiar with uh, the YouTube channel PragerU. They are a, an infamous uh, conservative uh, propaganda machine, essentially, um, that it makes these these comically bad five minute videos arguing conservative talking points. And something that's really interesting about them is their use of data visualizations. This is one from a video they did about uh, about modernism, postmodernism, decline of artistic standards since uh, the la in the, over the last hundred years. And the argument, and, and every single one of these visualizations looking at has an argument. And the argument for this one is that the artistic standards have declined dramatically in the last hundred years. Um, here's the thing. This isn't actually a data visualization. There's no data here. Like how, who is measuring artistic standards? How, like, have they really been doing it for the last 200 years in a systematic way? Like what, like what metric, is, this is, this is, this is nonsense. Like this is literally not data. This is just someone drew a line, drew some lines on, uh, you know, on a digital piece of paper and presented it like this. Um, but it, it, they just have an important takeaway here because they do this for a reason, because the aesthetic of visual of data visualization can phase authority even when no data is present. Again, we look at something that, that, that looks like a graph and we're like, ah, there's something here, even when there might actually not be anything here. So this is a kind of just, again, a final warning. You have to critique your data visualizations. You can't just trust them. Um, this is a really interesting example from, uh, I got from a video on climate change denialism made by a man named Harry Brewis uh, on YouTube. Um, he does a lot of really fantastic, uh, fantastic video essays. I recommend checking him out if you like stuff that is both, if you like uh, sort of debunkings of conservative arguments um, that are funny. Um, and so this is a, uh, a graph that was taken from a um, NASA study on the change of Greenland, the mass of Greenland's ice sheet. Um, what's the argument of this visualization? Well, it looks, well, it's, it's kind of stated explicitly there, but even if you just, if you, without, um, without the words, you can kind of tell uh, that the argument is that Greenland's ice sheet has lost almost 300 billion tons of mass per year on average. Um, my issue is not with this uh, visualization on its own. This visualization is 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 okay, um, but this is. But I think this is a really interesting example because we move on. Uh, this visualization was used in an argument um, on the conservative website uh, um, Louder with Crowder in an argument by someone named Courtney Kirchhoff uh, to say that uh, to basically argue against climate change by saying that uh, glaciers are growing again. To go back to the visualization, we notice how it's not a strict decline, but sort of there's a seasonal element to the change of Greenland's ice sheets. Um, you know, obviously during one part of the during the warm part of the year they melt. During the cold part of the year, they re, they reaccumulate some of their mass. But overall, there's a loss. But what happened in this and I don't, what happened in this article is that they zoomed in on that little peak at the very bottom there and like, oh look, the ice sheet is growing. <laughs> so. The, the takeaway here is that scale matters. Um, you can very easily take a perfectly reasonable visualization, zoom in on a really specific part or zoom out on a really specific, on, on just look at the whole thing and you can completely change, change the argument behind the visualization. Um, scale does matter. You have to make sure, make sure that your scale is, when you're making visualizations, you have to make sure that your scale is very clear and if there are sort of those finer resolution variations, you have to make sure there's some explanation for them. 
Uh, this is one I think was real. This is a recent example I thought was really fascinating. Uh, this is something I encountered on Twitter. Um, and so uh, this is data about a, an anime uh, that was taken from my anime list, which I think is a anime ranking website. Uh, I haven't used it, which is, which is, as you'll see, is part of the problem. Um, and I thought this was a really fascinating graph because uh, what is the argument here? Um, well, um, the, statistically, the argument is that the, uh, the, um, the average rating of this anime on my anime list has declined about 0.5 points about one month since the premiere of the second season. But if we look, the graph makes it look like a pretty dramatic fall. Um, but as we look at the scale, it's again, it's, it's, it's between eight and 8.5. And so I was like, this graph is really overstating that 0.5 difference, isn't it? I was wrong in an interesting way because a lot of people pointed out, uh, as a lot of people pointed out to me, that small change actually is very significant on this website um, because a, um, that like just a 0.33 drop took the show from ranked 160 amongst all anime down to rank 524, and it's still dropping. So apparently this is a significant decline. Um, however, I have no way of knowing that from this from this visualization. Uh, the thing that I, is, th this visualization, again, is fine on its own, but it's actually, the point that, that's, that's, that the person who made it is trying to make is completely concealed to anyone who doesn't have the, the requisite background information. Um, so the takeaway here is that you need to leave room for context in your visualization. You can't just assume people who are going to be seeing your visualization will have the background information necessary to put together, to put together your argument. Um, I think a much better visualization in this case would have been a, what, exactly what the person on, on top there said, um, a visualization showing the decline in the show's rank over that same period of time rather than just looking at the raw scores. Because that has a lot more of a, um, <coughs> excuse me, I've been talking a lot. That has a much more um, intuitive understanding than just showing a decline in raw numbers that is meaningless to someone who isn't familiar with the service. Um, now, a couple of really good case, a couple of really good data visualizations. Um, this right here is uh, often regarded as uh, one of the best data visualizations of all time uh, um, by a man named Paul Menard. Um, it was written, made, created in 1869, and it is a visualization of um, the, it's a visualization of basically of, of Napoleon's invasion of Russia in 1812. Um, this thing is extraordinary in a lot of ways. Um, uh, it's, it's the, it looks like a, like a 2D line chart, but really this, this, this thing is measuring at least six different uh, variables. Um, you have elements of geography, you have the temperature, they have the relevant temperatures, uh, you have the names of major battles and locations, um, and you have sort of really this thing is charting the entire movement um, of Napoleon's forces in a really innovative way that, that conveys a really strong message uh, with the um, with the brown, uh, the, the kind of brownish lines representing uh, Napoleon's forces moving into Russia and the black lines representing Napoleon's forces moving out of Russia, um, what, this are, what this visualization is conveying is the dramatic failure of Napoleon's invasion. Um, and even if you don't speak French, I think it's pretty easy to, to see to, to the, the uh, sort of the scope of that failure is evident from just from the visualization. Um, my takeaway here, when I say data visualization is an art, I mean a lot more than just it has to, it's pretty. Obviously, I think this, I think that this visualization is striking. I want a full size print of this on my wall. Um, but I do mean, I, what I'm trying to communicate is that a lot of the programs we're gonna be talking about today to make data visualizations are in here, are of course programmatic. They do visualization in a very limited specific way. This was done by hand, which obviously took a tremendous amount of research and attention to detail and artistic skill. But like the Joanna Drucker uh, visualization we looked at earlier, when you're doing data visualization and you actually want to uh, account for subjectivity, account for variance, account for the, the massive levels of, um, of, of like, account for all the things in your, in your visualization that you normally couldn't, um, then um, you need to think about, you need to get, you basically need to get creative. Think about different ways to correlate um, the different relationships between the variables in the visualization in a manner that is is that is visually striking and subject and suggestive. Um, think about how you can show as much as possible while concealing as little as possible while also making your argument. Um, and think about it not as oh I just have to plug some numbers into this program here and get a chart, but think about it as how do I this is think approach every visualization as if you were an artist trying to make the most powerful painting that you could. 
Last, uh, last case study I want to talk about here is slavevoyages.org. This is a really extraordinary website uh, that um, collates a ton of information about uh, the transatlantic slave trade. Um, I say every visualization has an argument. Um, this one, I couldn't, I could come up with too many arguments. There's no one argument that's being made uh, by this visualization. This is a screenshot actually that I took from a time lapse. Um, that is one of the kind of key features of the website. Uh, as you can, each of those little dots on the map represents a slave ship. The size of the size of the dot represents the number of slaves who are on that ship. And then, of course, it shows uh, where in Africa the ships are originating, and then where in the uh, Western Hemisphere they wound up. Um, that visualization on the bottom is sort of the sum total uh, of slave exports. Um, it's a really brutal and kind of amazing in a dark way visualization watching it in real time. Um, but the amazing thing, the, for that, at least to me, about um, slave voyages is that this is not the only visualization. There are tons of ways to look at this exact same data in different configuration, using different kinds of charts. You can filter in different ways. Um, and what I think is really impressive about this, about this website is not only that they did the hard work of gathering all this data and presenting it in a way that is easily accessible, uh, but the interactivity in the multiple points of view. If we're, we're talking about subjectivity and visualization, we're talking about not wanting to create graphics that presuppose a certain view of reality. A good way to do that is through, um, sorry, is through multiple points of view. Creating, uh, make, making sure that you people who are who are looking at your visualizations have can access the visualization in different ways because what might be your, what might be hidden by a line graph might be revealed by a bar chart, for example. Um, and I think that uh, I really recommend going and playing around on slavevoyages.org a little bit and looking at all the visualizations they offer. It's a really incredible experience, and it's a very it reminds us of you know a very dark history. Um, and it's very important information, and it's just a fantastic example of how powerful good data visualization can be. So now we've gone through some case studies, and hopefully I've communicated some good best, some best practices and some worst practices with data visualization. Um, talk to you about some tools that you can use to make data visualizations. Fortunately, good tools are much more plentiful for visualization than they are for machine learning, but the same limitations do apply. The more the tool does for you, <coughs> excuse me, the less that you're able to do yourself. So everything that you, everything that you're relying on the tool to do that you can't do on your own, that's another level. That's another space uh, for inaccuracy uh, for the tools inherent biases to get into your work. Um, and also, just a kind of a quick warning: if you're using, whenever you're using cloud-based tools, just be wary of using any data you want you want kept private. Um, since you're going to be, if you're going to be uploading data to some sort of cloud service, you want to make sure that no one else is going to be able to have access to that. So a couple of tools, uh, Tableau is easily the most popular. Um, it's, uh, it's very robust. You can make all sorts of visualizations with it. There's a ton of documentation, a ton of examples from other users, uh, and there's a free plan available, uh, but your work isn't private if you're on free plans, so just keep that in mind. Um, still, if you're getting, looking to get started in data visualization, Tableau is a great option just because there's so much uh, uh, material available for it. Infogram is an alternative to Tableau. Um, it's got a really simple drag and drop inter interface and like Tableau as a free plan. Um, although the free plan is pretty restrictive on what features you can use. Still, it's a little bit easier to use than Tableau. So um, uh, if Tableau is a little intimidating to you at first, uh, Infogram, or if you're looking to do something pretty simple, Infogram is an option for you. Google Charts is uh, a really good way to create interactive visualizations. So things you can actually get in and play around with. And it's entirely free which is nice. The problem compared to the other two is that there's limited support. Um, there's a couple forums and some documentation, uh, but if you can't figure out how to do something, you're either gonna have to experiment on your own or, or kind of you know work in this backend, uh, or you're just gonna be kind of out of luck. And uh, my uh, favorite data visualization tool of all time is called ggplot2. Um, it is a package for the R programming language. You do have to know how to use R in order to use it, but it is systematic, meaning that um, you can easily translate visualizations between data sets and apply modifications in a systematic way. It's absolutely free. Um, it's extensible. People are creating modifications and extensions for it all the time. Um, I think, and I think it makes absolutely gorgeous visualizations. The one on the example on the left there is a pretty simple one. Uh, you can do that in a couple lines of code. And I've made some, I, I really should have included some of my favorite of my own visualizations here. I don't know why I forgot to do that. Probably, oh, probably because they're on, I don't have them saved on this laptop. Anyway, that's right. <laughs> Never mind. I'm just thinking out loud. 
Um, but I've made some really, uh, some visualizations I'm very proud of using ggplot2. It's my favorite tool. Um, I think it's worth learning R just to be able to use it, but that's just me, I have a bias. So to sum up um, ethical visualization, remember that every visualization is an argument, uh, that every visualization um, obscures reality, as can, uh, can obscure reality at least as much as it represents it. Um, and some best practices for representations, they account for context, uh, they account, they display multiple points of view, they're forthcoming with their subjectivities and failures, and they explore multiple relationships between variables. So that basically is uh, what I have for you today. Um, this, uh, these last couple slides, I have a lot of um, links to either, um, to resources either that were included in the previous presentation and this one just kind of all one place as well as some additional resources. Um, I mentioned earlier talking about other ethical issues in AI. Uh, Jacqueline Wernemont's uh, Angry Bibliography on Machine Behavior is a great reading list uh, for um, sort of social science and ethical considerations in AI. Um, other uh, resources for learning uh, about gathering data set, learning programming, learning visualization, and then um, some interesting uh, data resources at the bottom there. And that's that's it. Um, okay, I made it through 10 minutes ago. Fantastic. Uh, thank you all so much for listening. Um, I saw throughout the presentation that there's a lot going on in the chat. So I'm sure uh, we'll catch up on that. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them now. And please keep in touch. I'm on Twitter, I have a website, uh, and everything is linked in the uh, in the presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Brienne. That was wonderful. Yeah, the um, the chat was quite active. Um, I was putting in a lot of uh, links and sort of reflecting on a lot of the things that you were saying. Um, there's been comments and commentary in the chat, but as of yet, I'm not seeing. Um, I don't think I've seen any questions come in, and I don't know if yeah. anyone is um, uh, in the middle of typing a question right now, or if. Um, anyone wants to raise their hand and unmute themselves and ask a question that way. Uh, just keeping in mind that um, if you do that, you'll be part of the recording. Yeah. Um, but that was just really, um, it was really fantastic. And I loved how you started with some of the, um, the problematic visualizations when you got to that, mm -hmm. the second half of the, of the session. Um, I, we were talking just before this workshop started, I took a information visualization class in library school. And that's how we actually learned visual, how to do visualizations was we would start by work looking at bad ones. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we'd look at bad and good each week, we'd sort of nominate them and talk about what makes them bad and good. And, and the problems that you um, pointed out of scale context um, were some of the biggest problems we would see. We'd see things where people wouldn't use consistent colors <laughs> if, if you have like a visualization dashboard, they wouldn't use consistent colors um, for similar variables across many, um, many graphs or have um, irregular or inconsistent Y scales, things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, um, I think that, that all the visualizations I showed were, were at least competently made, which is, which is sort of, which is a, a, a entirely different um, category from just bad visualizations that are are just poorly put, that are just weirdly put together, um, and um, so it's just yeah. But I I do agree. Like I critiquing visualizations of pastime for me, I think is one of the most fun things out there. I love finding uh, bad graphs and making fun of them and figuring out what they're doing wrong. Uh, but it is also very enlightening about how people can misrepresent information and how uh, just the problem, again, the sort of inherent flaws of data visualization. So yeah, I, I... And sometimes those things are done accidentally mm -hmm. and sometimes they're done purposefully. Um, and we don't always know um, whether it's an intentional or an unintentional mistake, but um, the more um, skilled we are in reading the visualizations and yeah. figuring out what the argument is, what the motivation behind it is, um, what the context is, um, the, the better we're able to then assess them. And that's the first step to making better visualizations ourselves. And of course, to even asking, is this appropriate as a visualization? Should I even do it? Mm -hmm. um, because not all things need to or should be visualized. Um, and in fact, I was really struck by your using slaveoyages.org, slave which I actually use in a lot of my intro to DH uh, workshops to talk about critical digital humanities and the problematics of visualization mm -hmm. and the, the problems of 
recreating some of the power structures that um, led to and uh, led to race-based slavery and structural racism in this in, in the Americas. That is to say, the boiling down a person or a series of people into a dot on a map mm -hmm. um, and sort of dehumanizing them. And so the visualization can be both very powerful and convey a really important argument and also be problematic at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, it's it is it's it's like I like I mentioned in the in the presentation with Slave Voyages. There's just so much there that I think it's it, there's there's so much to talk about with it. Yeah. Um, and it's it's it it does a phenomenal job of conveying the scale, which is I think of of the uh, transatlantic slave trade, which I think is something that's easy to to not think about, um, especially in the United States where we try to think about slavery as little as possible. Um, unfortunately um but it really is kind of overwhelming when you see all the dots but yeah at the same time what is you know what exactly is is are those dots telling us about slavery or about the people who are the victims of slavery well and, and thinking about what a yeah. dot represents in that visualization mm -hmm. which as i recall it's not a human it's a ship full of humans mm -hmm. and that's what is the choice in making that the scale rather than individual people as dots mm -hmm. and how do they visualize the loss of lives in the middle passage. So the dots don't change in size as they cross the Atlantic, for instance. Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of things that um, we could, we could take that visualization and work with it and do other things with it and convey it in other ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are important questions to be asking when we approach a visualization. Um, yes. And sometimes we don't know the answers, right? Sometimes, and, and that's the whole point. And a lot of humanists talk about like making your decisions transparent, mm -hmm. explaining what, what data are missing, what are, you know, if you're using existing data, what are the assumptions behind the data that were collected or that you're using, anything like that. Um, I'm monopolizing the Q&A session, so is, does anybody else have comments or questions for Brienne? We have a few minutes left, um, but um, I, I could keep going on and on. Brienne and I've had many conversations over the years about just these sorts of things, and mm -hmm. um, but I don't want to take up all of the, the space here. Should put person who spends too much time thinking about graphs on my business card. <laughs> yeah, um, if you do, uh, if you don't have any questions now, um, my email and my contact info are linked uh, in the presentation. Um, please reach out at any time. I'd be happy to kind of hear out uh, any questions or concerns you have. Um, and um, you can keep up with the kind of uh, digital humanities work that I do. And again, just make sure you grab those uh, slides so you can have access to all those resources I linked uh, if you are interested in pursuing any of this stuff further. And I'll be sending out a follow-up email to everybody with the links to the slides and the recordings for both last week and this week. Once um, the recording for this week is up on our, our DH YouTube channel. Um, and then I've put a link in chat to a feedback form if you want to let us know um, how this workshop went uh, or recommend uh, future topics for workshops in the future, um, uh, particularly virtual workshops. Um, as I said, we'll be having two digital pedagogy workshops in April for folks who teach in this space. Um, it's a way to sort of think about things you could be doing in next year, so not intended to be implemented this semester, which is already well underway. Um, but please do take a few minutes to let us know how we did. Um, and we still have time for a few questions if anyone has any um, uh, that you want to either put in chat or um, unmute yourself and just ask, um, ask for yourself. Uh, and if not, we can just end a few minutes. Oh, I can stop the recording and we can, mm -hmm. we can continue chatting as well. So I'll just give it another 10 or 15 seconds in case anybody's typing. Mm -hmm. And once again, thank you all for, for attending and uh, for being a fantastic audience. I really appreciate it. Sorry, my voice started giving out towards the end. There was a lot of, a lot of talking. Okay. It doesn't look like any questions are coming in. So I think what I'll do is stop the recording. So I just want to um, encourage everyone to stay safe, stay healthy, um, stay home, and mask up when you can. Um, so thanks again, everybody. And we hope to see you at the next DH event.